Does anyone else remember this from the anime? Yeah, this snake is really cool. It's also intimidating, and it's a Pokemon that I've actually never used before. So I'm excited to go evil today and take on the game with this Team Rocket Pokemon. Will it be an easy playthrough, or am I going to be blasting off at the speed of light over and over? Let's find out. Here are the rules, I've also left them in the description so that you can reference them later if you need to. I nicknamed my Ekans Ashland to say thanks to one of my patrons. I think it's a great name for this awesome snake. Unfortunately, the back sprite leaves a lot to be desired. Well, uh, yeah, so this one's just bad. Like, it sort of looks like a strange light bulb or something. I'm not sure. Honestly, the upgraded sprites in Pokemon Yellow are just amazing. If they had also updated the back sprites, I think that this would be nearly a perfect game. Okay, so moving on from unsightly back sprites, Ekans' speed is much more worrying. Eevee is going first. If I lose to the rival here, then he's going to choose Vaporeon. Yes, he chooses Vaporeon if you lose here, no matter what the outcome of the fight is on Route 22. If this happens, Ekans also won't level up, and that means that I'll be really behind for the Brock split. This is the reason that I basically never face his Vaporeon team. It's because it really puts a Pokemon at a disadvantage for Brock. I'll only proceed with a playthrough losing in the lab if it's not possible to proceed any other way. In this case, Eevee knocks out Ekans and uh, yeah, so uh, I decide to start over again. I think that if Ekans can just get a bit luckier with Wrap, then I'll be able to knock the Eevee out. It's worth noting that I play my playthroughs with perfect DVs to see what the Pokemon's peak performance is. However, when the game gives you your starter, it sets the DVs randomly and calculates the Pokemon stats based on them. My software sets the DVs to perfect values, but there's always a moment where the game randomizes the DVs right before they're adjusted by my software. So there's no way around this, and that means that Ekans for this first battle will always have imperfect stats. This is because Pokemon stats are only recalculated every time it levels up or when it's withdrawn from the PC. So until my starter levels up to level 6, it's not going to have perfect stats. Here's why this matters today. In the first fight, Ekans spawned and it had 10 speed, but in the second fight, it gets 11. That means that now it's moving first against the Eevee. Uh, actually, we're speed tied because Eevee moves first once, but this small change lets Ekans run away with the victory. As I move on onto Route 1, let's discuss the poison type, and honestly it has lots stacked against it in yellow version. Here are just a few key trainers that got team updates, making them far more challenging for poison types to defeat. Koga, Blaine, Giovanni, Lorelei, Bruno, uh, wait, who's that? Agatha, Lance, and the champion. So the late game is going to be very challenging, but the early game could be challenging too, because Ekans honestly does not have very good base stats. Ekans has 35 HP, 60 attack, 44 defense, 40 special, and 55 speed, giving it a 10.74% chance to crit. While that is a decent crit rate, its poor typing in combination with these base stats seem to be setting it up for a performance that is going to be similar to like coughing or Zubat. Uh... However, Pokemon like Rattata performed quite well despite their low stats, and that's because they had diverse move pools that synergized with their stats. Uh, yeah, Ekans has this too because its attack is its best stat. Bite, Acid, Body Slam, Earthquake, Dig, and Rock Slide are all physical moves, and that's just fantastic for it. Additionally, it also gets Mega Drain, and this could be helpful for coverage if it needs it. The first major obstacle to overcome in any one of these playthroughs is Brock. Today, Rap's giving me hope, because while each hit will only deal one damage, most likely that is, it can deal up to five hits per turn. Also, because it prevents the opponent's Pokemon from moving, it's going to allow me to trap his Pokemon potentially infinitely. All I need to ensure is that Ekans is going to outspeed the Onix. It's uh, obviously going to outspeed the Geodude. Another great synergy here for Ekans is that it has Leer, and this is going to be helpful in lowering Brock's Pokemon's defense so that perhaps Rap can deal more than one damage with each hit. So to make this fight a success, I'm going to need to level up until I have at least 24 speed. That's the magic number so that I can outspeed Onix, which only has 23 speed. Today I'll fight the optional rival west of Viridian on Route 22 to gain some extra experience and level up faster for Brock. Unfortunately, the Spearow has 19 speed, so it goes first, uses Growl, and Ekans has its attack lowered. Rap misses, Spearow growls again, it misses, Rap misses again, and then Spearow growls for a third time. Yuck, this is not a good start to the fight. While Rap is able to take the Spearow down, it misses once against Eevee, and Ekans has sand blown in its face, lowering its accuracy. Rap already wasn't very accurate, so now the fight slips through my grasp. 
The solution here is also to outspeed the Spearow. I spent some time leveling up to level 10, and at this level, Ekans has 20 speed, so now it's moving first. Because of this, I am now going to be able to win, even if Rap misses a couple of times along the way. So I'll take a moment and discuss why I want the rival to choose Jolteon. This is by far the hardest team that he can have for two reasons. First, his Jolteon is a great Pokemon, and second, Flareon has a psychic move in the form of Reflect during the last two battles. So the rival is just going to spam it instead of attacking when the user is playing with a poison type. However, Jolteon has Pin Missile, which is a bug type move. In Generation 1, bug moves are super effective against poison types, so it's actually going to be doing damage where the Flareon won't be. Interestingly enough, poison type is actually super effective against bug types as well. In yellow, the forest contains four different species of Pokemon, Caterpie, Metapod, Pidgey, and Pidgeotto. The Weedle, Kakuna, and Pikachu have all been replaced from red and blue. Because Caterpie and Metapod are the most common, Poison Sting actually provides a really fast way for Ekans to train up. At level 13, it has 24 speed, and with that, I think that I'm ready to attempt Brock for the first time. Please, Rap, be enough. Okay, so uh, here's the live audio from my first encounter with the Rock Solid Pokemon Trainer. Uh, not very confident, but we'll see. Okay, so I'm taking five hit points of damage. I'm gonna outspeed his Pokemon. And so I was thinking that Rap might be able to do it, but with how much I'm dealing to the Geodude, I'm just not really thinking that that's gonna be the case. I've already used 5 PP. Like, I'm gonna need more against the Onyx. I guess I can Leer here. Maybe I can Leer it down really low if it uses Bide once. That's bad. That's really bad. No! No! Uh, okay, well, I'll just try and wrap Chain it. Oh, it's doing like nothing. Gotta be careful. Don't wanna accidentally use the wrong move. Uh, Cause like, it switches into Bide. Really need to use Leer. Maybe if I get a crit? Or just keep hitting? I should do this. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Please. Wait, I'm, is it, I don't know if that's one health. Ah, yes. Did it. Sweet. Oh, I'm so happy. Okay, well that's cool. Good job, Ashland. All right, let's get going. And that's going to be pretty easy because Ekans can't be poisoned on Route 3. Poison Sting makes the bugs here fast to knock out. There are some poison types here that are a bit annoying. Rap's obviously a good move to use against them. In Mount Moon, Ekans doesn't match up well against many of the trainers, so I just decide to skip them. One Paris does show up, so I decide to knock it out. These ones actually give surprisingly good experience. It only takes a single hit from my Poison Sting to faint it anyways. It's probably a good thing too that I knocked it out, because I was getting really worried about my PP in the fight with the Super Nerd. If I run out of rap, I'll be stuck with only Poison Sting for the battle with Jesse and James. So I want to level up to level 17 to learn Bite so that this isn't the case. Being forced to use only Poison Sting against their Poison types sounds awful, so I just really don't want to do that. Luckily for me though, after I knock out the nerds coughing, Ekans levels up and it learns Bite just in time. It does half damage to Jesse's Ekans, who retaliates with rap, but it only lasts two turns and her Ekans goes down to a second Bite. Meowth time. It outspeeds, does a lot of damage with its own bite, and then I take it to orange. Its second bite puts Ekans at 21 hit points for the coughing. This cute, round, adorable poison type can be annoying with smog because it has a 40% chance to inflict poison, but that's not going to be an issue today because I'm a poison type. Even with low health, I'm able to defeat Team Rocket here and blast off to the next section of the game. Rival 2 leads with Spiro, and it has 33 speed, meaning that Ekans is going to move second. With a physical attacker, the bird can cause havoc if it uses Growl. I avoid having any of my stats altered and knock it out. That's good because the sand attacking demon is next. It's slow, so Rap is going to be a good solution here, albeit an imperfect one, and slightly ironic because I end up missing Rap because of accuracy, and then Santru will have the chance to use sand attack. Ah, uh, this was tense. Ah, uh, please let me get by. Looks like it's going to work. It does. Rattata's a 2 hit, and then Eevee's a 3 hit. No problems for Ekans here. Let's check in now with how Ekans is doing so far. Honestly, I'm surprised. I did think that it was going to take a few more levels to get past Brock, which would have really slowed the backward snake down. The advantage that Ekans has against the Caterpie line with Poison Sting is really helpful for Ekans in the early game. With that portion of the game out of the way, I think that things are going to improve even more for Ekans, and that's because there's some really great moves just around the corner. 
On Nugget Bridge, I was a little bit disappointed because I did need to backtrack to heal, I just didn't have quite enough PP. But it's important to do this today because this hiker with a Geodude is going to be really slow. After finishing off his Machop, he sends in his Geodude, and this is where everything is going to grind to a complete stall. When I miss, the Geodude has the opportunity to attack, and it does a decent amount of damage. So this fight really isn't a sure thing. Losing after investing so much time in a fight is so painful, I really should have saved before this one. However, Ekans takes the victory on its first attempt. No resetting yet. With Nugget Bridge out of the way, I have to decide if I want to face Misty or head south to Vermilion and upgrade my moves first. Overall, going south is slower, but I could grab Dig and then head back to Misty just after getting it. To do this though, I have to make it past the Rocket's Drowsy, which knows both Confusion and Hypnosis. That makes it a scary foe for Ekans to face. Also, Bite in this generation is a normal type move, so I don't have super effective damage here. Luckily, Drowsy misses its Hypnosis and Bite does just enough damage, even with neutral effectiveness. The prize for winning is Dig, and I teach it to Ekans right away. Now, let's take Misty on. Staryu is first, and it has 38 speed. Convenient that Ekans has 39 speed at level 22, allowing it to move first and consistently strike with Dig. It does around 3 quarters damage, Water Gun does a quarter, and then Staryu faints to my follow up bite. Ekans levels up, but this is nowhere near being faster than the Starmie. I need to hope that Dig has enough power. And then Misty does a big brain play, X defend into Harden while I use Dig. That cuts my damage so much. I felt hopeless here. And then Ekans gets a massive crit and Starmie faints. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that fight needs to be tested. <laughs> I've got ideas how to make it consistent for my second playthrough, even without going to Vermilion City first. But today I've defeated her, so there's nothing left for me here in Cerulean now. On my way south, I pick up the Hidden Full Restore, reorder my bag in preparation for Rock Tunnel, and then I use a Repel so that I can approach this trainer from behind. I fight him first because I want to use him as preparation for the junior trainer right above him with three Pidgeys. One level here can make or break it against her team, because all of her birds know Sand Attack. By fighting him first, sometimes I level up one more time. Luckily for me today, the experience from the fight does level Ekans up. I save before her because I want to play safe. Alright, let's try this. Bite isn't doing enough damage, and I get hit with Sand Attack first turn. Okay, that's a bad start, but Ekans doesn't care. It shrugs off the lowered accuracy and proceeds to hit every single bite from here on out, claiming an easy victory. On the SSN, I always grab rest on my first playthrough just for safety, unless I really think the Pokemon doesn't need it. In yellow, it's incredibly useful, especially against the champion stall-oriented team. There is a trainer right in front of it that I do have to face, and today he scares me a little bit when Dig gets a Gen 1 miss, and he takes Ekans into red with Staryu. It's a good thing that I am able to defeat him because my last save was right in front of the Pidgey Jr. trainer. In the cabins in the same corridor as Rest, there are actually two useful items that I normally don't pick up. There's a Max Potion in here and an Aether over here. I'm debating if I should usually pick these up because they can be helpful and there's only like a 4 or 5 second loss of time to do it. If these items prevent 1 or 2 sender trips, then they will be worth it. However, an item I never debate getting when I can use it is TM08. Body Slam is an amazing replacement for Bite. Higher base power and a 30% chance to paralyze? Yeah, I uh, can't skip this. One thing I always forget to mention, and honestly I just forget in general though, is that in Generation 1, moves can't afflict status conditions to a target that shares the type with the move. So an example is that Body Slam can't paralyze a normal type Pokemon. This only applies though if the status is the move's secondary effect. So moves like Thunder Wave and Sleep Powder can still inflict status conditions on Electric and Grass types respectively. An example of this playing out is the rival fight on the SSN. Body Slam can actually never paralyze his Spiro, Rattata, or Eevee. And now with him out of the way, I grab Cut and I head over to face Surge. I choose Glare, Raichu moves first, uses Thunderbolt, gets a crit, <laughs> and Ekans faints. Ugh, what a great start to this gym battle. At least it was a fast loss. Let's try again. This time it uses Mega Punch, doing almost half to Ekans. My Glare paralyzes, and that means that I have a Speedy Snake. I use Dig, hoping for a one hit, and then Ekans gets a crit. So yeah, that's another lucky gym win. I was hoping to get information about how much damage Dig would do against the Raichu, but we'll just have to wait till my tests to find out. Between Cerulean City and Lavender Town is a gauntlet of powerful trainers. This is quite frankly the most challenging spot in terms of random NPCs. The wrapping lass is first. Uh, yes, she is a lass. How do I know? Well, because of her overworld sprite. Like, visuals are always a more reliable factor than text. Like, uh, 
Yeah, just all the people that have this overworld sprite, definitely lasses. Dig should be able to one-hit all of her Pokémon because it does neutral damage to them. Uh, or not. Oddish survives, giving her a chance to set up Paralysis, and now the Wrap combo is possible. But it just doesn't do this and uses Absorb instead. Okay, whatever. There's still one more Oddish that could mess with me. However, this time Ekans gets a better roll, and that's victory number one in the gauntlet. The second trainer is the Pokemaniac just inside of Rock Tunnel. Cubone's his lead, and Ekans doesn't have a good choice here because the skull wearing cutie has great defense. It strikes back with Bone Club, and oh no, this is very bad. Uh, actually, it's worse because that's a Gen 1 miss, and Cubone knocks Ekans out. I try again, and this time I get past Cubone with red health, but this isn't the end of the fight. No, it's nowhere close, because there's a Slowpoke next. Another Pokemon that's really strong against Ekans, and also has super effective damage and decent physical bulk. It comes out, and it ends the battle with confusion. So I tried one more time thinking that Glare could help, by the way it won't, and Ekans goes down for a third time, and that convinces me that I need to train. Luckily, I only battled the two mandatory trainers on the prior route, so it's quick to backtrack and defeat everyone here. I save in front of this youngster because believe it or not, his Santrunos Fissure. It's actually a move that's specifically programmed in just for this Santru. Like, I'm not really sure why Game Freak did that, but alright, it's interesting. Today, Ekans knocks it out with no issues though. However, uh, then this Santru gets me. Whoops, guess I got a reset. That's a 1 minute and 8 second time loss because of it. The silver lining here though is that this time the Sancho uses Fissure, so uh, we can all see it now. After that, I get back to the fight that caused the reset, and again, I don't save. Like, uh, sometimes I'm such a robot when I'm playing these challenges and I'm really not thinking. It leads to a scary scenario, and I need to take out his final Ekans and Sandshrew with only Wrap. My snake is having PP problems because of all the grinding, so please Wrap, don't miss. Okay, good. Okay, so now I'm two levels higher, let's try the Pokemaniac again. And uh, yeah, it's uh, still very bad. Well, it really isn't, and I'm sure that some of you have figured it out. You might even be screaming at your monitor by now. Both of his Pokemon are slow. Ekans is fast. So Wrap can be used to potentially avoid all damage in this fight, and I think that this is going to give me a better shot at winning. One thing I did miss here is that when his Pokemon get to around one third health, I should just use Dig instead. It has better accuracy, and that avoids the chance that Wrap would miss. However, in this case, it doesn't matter because spamming Wrap is enough and I'm able to knock out the Slowpoke as well. So that was the second trainer of the gauntlet that I just defeated. Now, the next trainer has another Slowpoke. In this case, it's also slow, so I can use Wrap again and knock it out. That's three of these trainers down. Next is this status condition girl. Her Pokemon love to put you to sleep, paralyze you, or poison you, but Ekans isn't really scared of any of that, and I take the victory fairly easily. But the fifth member of the gauntlet is the self-destructing hiker. What if Dig can't one-hit the Geodudes? Well, the first one blows up while I'm underground, and then Dig knocks the second one out. I think that that means that I win. Unless Graveler gets a crit with self-destruct. It has happened before, but not today. Ekans crits instead, and I've won. Now after that intense gauntlet of trainers, there's this junior trainer. She sort of acts as the finisher. So many times as a kid, I would almost make it through the cave. I would have one final Pokemon just barely hanging on with maybe a status condition like poison. And uh, yeah, then I'd bump into her. She'd just finish me off with quick attack or some awful sand attack strategy. Uh, this is so frustrating. I bet one or two of you have also had this experience. I've cleared the cave and it's time for Celadon City. I need a moment to rant now. It's clear that in Generation 1, the developers were trying to give Pokemon moves that thematically fit with the creature that they had designed. Rap, for instance, makes a lot of sense with a snake Pokemon. Glare makes sense for a Cobra to have, and Mega Drain obviously makes sense because I can see this thing biting and draining its foes. I can make a case for Earthquake, Fissure, and Dig too because snakes live on the ground and sometimes like to burrow, but you know what really doesn't make sense? You know what really grinds my gears? Ekans can learn Rock Slide. This is such an injustice because Aerodactyl, Omastar, and Kabutops can't. For Ekans, it's a miracle though because in combination with Earthquake, I now have an answer for nearly everything the game can throw at me. These two types just pair so well together offensively. For example, Dig can't be used against Flying-type Pokémon, but Rock Slide can, and it's super effective. To make these two physical moves even better, I buy three proteins and feed them to Ekans. With these two powerful physical moves, Pokémon Tower is extremely easy. As a result, after defeating the rival, I make the decision to train here against the Chandler's Ghastly. 
My special is my lowest stat, and earning some extra stat experience for it can't be a bad idea. Plus, Dig makes these battles really quick. After that, I continue training on Cycling Road. If I can get Ekans to level 37, then my repels will be consistent in the Safari Zone. Skipping the extra 2-4 encounters only saves around 12-16 to 16 seconds, but it's really nice to do if I can. Plus, I'm going to need to train at some point, and now is a better time than ever. Because the Koga Sabrina level jump is coming up, and they both have powerful psychic type moves. Plus, all the trainers here are clustered so close together that it makes training on them very quick. After completing the Safari Zone, it makes sense to do Erika next. Plus, I can level up in her gym. During this training, I have to decide if I want Ekans to learn Acid. This would be its only stab poison move. You're uh, having a bad day with your move pool when Acid is the best poison move you can learn? Ugh. I'll pass. Earthquake, Rock Slide, Body Slam, and Glare is just a much better set. Erika opens with Tangela. I use Glare for Paralysis. Honestly, I don't really need that. Erika has good AI, so Tangela is only going to use Bind and Constrict. Funnily enough, in this fight, Constrict is more of a concern because it can lower speed. However, it doesn't, and Ekans moves on to Weep and Belt. Dig takes it to orange, it hits a crit with Razor Leaf, doing about a third, and then faints. Gloom is last, and it's going to take two hits. Ekans survives its pedal dance, and that's that. Here's my misplay of the run, I use Rock Slide against Machoke. Uh, hopefully that's the worst one that happens. Uh... After that, I head to Sylph and grab the TM for Earthquake. I won't be using this right away, Dig's a useful field move right now, plus hanging onto the TM gives me more flexibility with my moves for later on. Because Ekans is in the 40s, I want to take on the rival now. I know that I'll need more training before Koga and Sabrina, so I wasn't really invested in the outcome of this fight, and that's really fortunate, because uh, I would feel really bad if I expected to win here. Ekans' lack of defense means Swift is doing a lot. Plus, it hits me when I'm underground, so there's no way that I'm going to win this fight without more levels. It's time to grind up in Sylph. I fought almost every single trainer in here, even the scarier ones like the Hypnos. That brings Ekans all the way up to level 47. Can I defeat the rival now? Dig does one third damage to Sandslash, it uses Slash, taking Ekans down to just above half health, and then I get a critical hit. Nice. The following Ninetales is a one hit with Dig, Cloister takes half from Rock Slide, and Aurora Beam does so much. Okay, that was close, but Ekans did survive. Rock Slide hits, Cloister faints, Kadabra gets outsped, and Ekans arrives at Jolteon. But it's fast and it has Pin Missile, which is a super effective bug move. But it misses! So yeah, that's that. A lucky win, so this spot is definitely going to need some testing. Koga's Gym is next. I save in here because the jugglers could be very scary. Luckily, I one-hit all the members on the first jugglers team. The second one won't be the same, his Pokémon are at a higher level. Hypno survives, but it doesn't use a psychic move. It's time for the Ninja Master himself. He sends out Venonat first. Despite him being a poison type gym leader, his Pokemon have move sets that suggest that they're actually psychic grass types. He also has good AI, so he's going to be using Psybeam and Psychic against Ekans with his first three team members. I'm relying on Rock Slide's super effective damage here to knock his Pokemon out as quickly as possible. The first two Venonat go down in a single hit, that's really nice, but the third one survives and gets a critical hit. Venomoth, the intimidating psychic ground type, comes out next, and it finishes Ekans off because it outspeeds. So it has 103 speed, so that means there's no way for me to move first. However, it does know Leech Life, which is also super effective against Ekans, and Koga could use an X attack at any moment. Plus the third Venonat got a crit. Without it, and with one turn of better luck on the Venomoth, I think that Ekans can do this. However, I lose again on my next fight. What I really need here is the ability to one-hit the third Venonat so that I can prevent damage until I arrive at Venomoth. In order to make this happen, I decided I needed to level up, so I head to Sabrina's gym. My attack stat in combination with my speed stat and dig makes me very confident here. After defeating all the trainers, I decide to try Sabrina out just in case it's possible. Unfortunately, Abra has 102 speed, so it moves first against Ekans. Kadabra hits Ekans with Psychic, and that's it. So here I am, heading out onto Route 15 to train. When this happens, I know that a Pokemon is not doing particularly well. However, Ekans doesn't feel that frustrating. The moves it has give it reliable paths to victory as long as its level is high enough. I'm going to aim to beat Koga first so that I can get the Soul Badge's speed boost for Sabrina. 
With it, I'm going to be able to move first against Abra, and perhaps with a few additional levels, I'll also move first against Kadabra as well. Luckily for me, this trip to Route 15 is short-lived because I level up on the first trainer. I'll head back to Koga now and see if I can knock the third Venonet out. The answer is... I am able to. Venomoth comes out, it uses Leech Life, that's perfect. Rock Slide hits doing three quarters, Venomoth uses Leech Life again, and Rock Slide finishes the fight. With the Soul Badge, Ekans now has 111 speed. That means I'll move first against Sabrina's Abra, but not against her Kadabra. It has 118 speed after all. So I'll need around four more levels to move first against it. All right, I'll head back to Route 15 and train. At level 56, I have 121 speed, so Ekans one-shots Abra and Kadabra. Alakazam's all that's left. The fact that Sabrina doesn't have good AI in yellow is the reason that I think I can do this. If she had it, I'd really need to just outspeed the Alakazam. Which is technically possible, but it would take a long time because it has 133 speed. One strategy here to actually outspeed the Alakazam would be to intentionally get hit with a flash from Ekans. I could spam glare until it happens and then move on. However, then my accuracy would be lowered and I really don't like that idea. I did contemplate this strategy instead of the training, but just because of its inconsistency I decided against it. Leveling up is obviously the consistent method for the first two Pokemon. Luckily, her Alakazam isn't great, so I finish it off and earn myself the Marsh Badge. Blaine is next, and things don't look good after he uses Flamethrower once. I am outspeeding the Ninetales, and Dig almost takes it out. I think that using 4 rare candies right now might be a good choice. I hesitate to do this usually because I'm scared about the late game, however I've trained a lot with Ekans and I think it's set up for late game success even if it uses them here. With my level boosted, Ninetales is a one hit, but what about Rapidash? Yeah, it falls too. Arcanine won't go down in a single hit, especially if it uses Reflect. I just need to hope that it doesn't hit me with Fire Blast or Flamethrower. He uses Takedown, and that allows Ekans to seize the victory. Giovanni leads with Dugtrio. It misses Fissure, Ekans crits with Dig, knocking it out. Next is Persian. It goes for double team, causing me to miss. It sets up again, my body slam does half, the cat screeches, and Ekans knocks it out. That screech badge boosted my attack stat, and that's going to make the Nidos easier. However, Nidoqueen still survives Earthquake and flattens Ekans, so I'm going to need more damage. To get it, I can use three more rare candies, and this additionally has another benefit. Ekans now has 135 speed. This is relevant because Dugtrio has 134. Since I'm outspeeding, I'm not going to get hit with its move, and that means I can move on to Persian with full health. Persian does have 135 speed, so that means we're tied. I move first twice, giving it only one turn to move. It chooses Screech, so once again, I've got my badge boost for the Nidos. I use Dig, but Nidoqueen hangs on again and knocks Ekans out. Ah, the next fight, Persian moves first instead, does a lot with Slash, and then it finishes Ekans with Fury Swipes. It's a... Uh, it's always painful losing to Fury Swipes. <laughs> it's time to use more rare candies. I use my final three, taking Ekans to level 66, giving it enough speed to move first against Persian every time. The levels actually haven't boosted my attack from what it was before. When I had the badge boost, I had 157 attack, but now without it, I have 151. So, uh, just great. <laughs> But a clutch critical hit comes through and Ekans finishes Nidoqueen. Nidoking is next. Without a critical hit dig, I still do enough. Now, Rhydon is last. For it, I specifically taught Ekans Mega Drain. Please let four times effective damage be enough. It is. And with that, Ekans is moving on. Teaching Ekans Mega Drain at this point in the playthrough has the added advantage that it can be used against the rival's team. It's great against his Sand Slash, and it's also great against his Cloister. This pre-league battle against him actually ends up being quite easy. So Ekans is arriving at the league at level 67. That's quite high, but I've used a lot of rare candies. How is it going to do? Will it struggle against one member, or will it get a clean sweep? Let's find out. Lorelei sends out Dugong. Rock Slide does a lot of damage, and the Water Ice type uses Rest falling asleep. Now it's a free knockout. Cloister comes out next. I wasn't sure if Rock Slide or Mega Drain was the best choice here. I experiment trying Mega Drain first because Cloister has lower special. After that, I try Rock Slide and it looks like they're doing about the same amount. Mega Drain does heal me though, and it's 100% accurate, so it's going to be the better choice. Lorelei tries to save Cloister with some super potions, but they aren't enough, and it goes down. Slow bro time. I mimic Amnesia and I pray that it doesn't use Psychic on the first turn. It doesn't, so that's good. I get set up twice before I get hit. 
Even with plus six special, Psychic hits hard, and I decide to finish it off without using rest. I don't want to waste any more time here. Rockslide knocks Jinx out, and with that, I think that I've done it. Mega Drain on Lapras heals Ekans, and then it retaliates with a Hydro Pump for only a small amount of damage. That's because of my ridiculous special stat. And with that, I've done it. I've defeated Lorelei. From here, things don't get uh, much harder, as you might expect, because the Hiker is next. For some reason, I use Earthquake on Onyx. Like, obviously, Mega Drain is better here. Uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to give him a chance. That's really what I'm doing. Hitmonchan takes two hits from Earthquake, and so does Hitmonlee. Luckily, they can't do much damage to me because I'm a Poison type. I use Mega Drain on the second Onyx, and uh, now there's only the Machamp left. It's quite bulky, so it takes three turns, but as expected, this is a straightforward victory. Now it's time for Agatha. Oh, Agatha, sometimes you're so terrifying, and sometimes you're one of the worst League members. Like, actually, maybe the worst League member. Earthquake makes her entirely trivial. The addition of Rock Slide also covers her Golbat, the only Pokemon that can't be hit with ground moves. Although sometimes it feels like her team is so bad against ground moves that even the Golbat goes down to them. Because Ekans is fast, I decided to just sweep without substitute, and yeah, I got it. All of her Pokemon go down to a single hit, with uh, the exception of the Golbat. Lance leads with Gyarados. It misses Hydro Pump and faints. That's uh, an impressive start for the Dragon Master. Earthquake does good damage to Dragonair, it does over a third with Hyper Beam, and then I knock it out. Time to mimic Ice Beam. But there's a problem with this strategy. I have no reliable recovery against Aerodactyl. I could try Mega Drain here because it's neutral. You can actually see in this footage that I'm thinking about it for a little bit, but in the end I decide on Rock Slide. Aerodactyl outspeeds, hits with Wing Attack, doing a little bit of damage, taking Ekans into red, and then Rock Slide hits, also taking the prehistoric Pokemon into red health. But unfortunately, because Lance is outspeeding, I don't go first and I faint. The next fight, the first Dragonair crits with Hyper Beam, and yeah, that takes Ekans down, so this is not going well. I'm uh, starting to run into problems at Lance. And the third time is definitely not the charm, because here I sustain a lot of damage against Gyarados and the first Dragonair. That allows the second one to take me out with Wrap. So yeah, I guess in this case, uh, Dragonair is the uh, superior snake. <laughs> it has the uh, superior wrapping skills. Fainting uh, to wrap is so painful. So I have one extra rare candy and I picked it up in Victory Road, but that probably won't help too much. I really need recovery here. In the place of Mega Drain, I teach Ekans my signature move, Rest. Now, even after Gyarados does damage with Hydro Pump and the Dragonair hits me with Hyper Beam, I can heal up and learn Ice Beam safely. Unfortunately, Ekans' special is trash, so even the Dragonair survives. It gets a Hyper Potion, prolonging the fight, it hangs on again, uses Wrap for maximum frustration, before finally it goes down. Aerodactyl uses Wing Attack, Ekans tanks it, and Ice Beam connects, getting a critical hit. Dragonite is all that's left. I outspeed, Ice Beam hits, and Lance is no more. All that's left is the champion, and he leads with Sand Slash. At this moment, uh, yeah, the fear sunk in. How am I gonna manage this thing? My Earthquake does about a third to it, and its Earthquake takes Ekans into the red. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll crit on the second turn? Nope, Ekans goes down. So uh, that's loss number one. Things can be worse though. Sand Slash can crit, and that knocks Ekans out in a single hit. Loss number two. So maybe I needed a different approach here. Maybe holding onto Mega Drain for Sand Slash might be more effective, but that's not an option now because I saved over it. Instead, I do something that I don't think I've ever done. I teach Ekans Fissure. It misses one turn, but on turn two it connects and Sand Slash faints. Alakazam is next. But yeah, it moves first because it's outspeeding, and that's really not good, so yeah, loss number three. Even if I make it past Sand Slash, I can't move first against Alakazam. Because I'm slower, Fissure can't hit it either. Perhaps you don't know, but one-hit KO moves cannot hit targets that are faster than the user. So yeah, that's not an option. So what's the solution here? I was thinking maybe I'll survive a Psychic or a Psybeam if Fissure takes the Sand Slash out on turn one and I have full health. Well, I lose five more times trying to get that luck. Finally, I get back to Alakazam, he uses Psychic, and yeah, Ekans faints, so that's, that's loss number nine. At this point, I was feeling quite bad. <laughs> I could potentially win if Alakazam uses Kinesis. 
Ideally it would miss, of course. There's a 1 in 3 chance of it selecting this move based on the rival's good AI. In fight number 11 it uses it and misses, so that's the perfect luck for Ekans. I use Earthquake, which is its most powerful physical move. And Alakazam survives. So you have to be kidding me. I cannot one-hit this thing? In fight 12, I miss with Fissure and lose. In fight 13, Sand Slash crits. In fight 14, I miss again. And again it happens in fight 15. I think that I really might have messed this up. I might need to black out here and level up more to be able to do it. I'll try a few more times and then I'll accept defeat and black out. Feeling the hopelessness sink in, I got a small consolation prize here because Fissure hits the Sand Slash at the start of fight 16. Alakazam comes out, uses Kinesis, it connects, lowering Ekans' accuracy, and my Earthquake misses as a result. Just great. I try Earthquake one more time in case it uses Kinesis again, but Ekans moves first this time. So Kinesis badge boosted my speed to 169, which is nice because now I'm faster than Alakazam. Earthquake hits, and because my attack also received a boost, the Alakazam fades in a single hit. I cannot believe that but my accuracy is ruined for the rest of the fight. So up next is the Executor. How's it gonna be? It's gonna use Hypnosis first turn and then normal moves. I wanna get it out of the way as fast as possible. I try for Fissure and it works on the first turn. So that's sweet. Cloister is next. Rock Slide misses on the first turn. Ah, just great. It uses Spike Cannon, which hits three times. Rock Slide isn't even doing half when it hits and the champion tries for Aurora Beam. Luckily my attack isn't lowered, and I get two more rock slides, knocking it out. Tail Whip is really bad right now because Jolteon has the physical pin missile, and it's super effective. Making matters even worse, Ninetales follows it up with a quick attack which gets a critical hit, taking Ekans down to 48 hit points. Because of priority, I've already selected my move so I can't heal now. I knock the Ninetales out, and Jolteon's next. I use Earthquake, because what else can I do? The Jolteon is obviously faster, it goes for pin missile, and it misses. Please, Kinesis, do not mess this up. Earthquake lands, and Jolteon faints. Ekans did it. One hour, 43 minutes, and 57 seconds. 34 resets at level 71, with a game time of 5 hours and 53 minutes. That, quite frankly, might be the luckiest champion that I've ever had. Kinesis badge boosting me was the only way that Ekans won this fight. I can't wait to test this out and figure out how to do it actually consistently, but before that I'm going to cool off with some calm fights against Mewtwo when I don't have to worry about the timer. Uh, by the way, here are my live reactions from when I fought it. Okay, Mewtwo time with only an Ekans. Can I do it? Let's find out. Uh, Which one? Maybe this- no, that's very bad. <laughs> A crit even for, uh, yeah. Rip. Okay, Mewtwo. Toxic strats, they're the best. Let's go. This one is not feeling very good. Yeah, it's gonna just wreck me like that most times. Okay, toxic, oh no. Oh, not again. Come on, not, mm. Okay. Okay. Crit, crit, yes, yes. Hype, oh, the recover is bad, but. Oh, that's really good, okay, okay, okay. 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 Oh, it did it. It did it. Took a lot of luck. <sighs> that sigh of relief felt so good after a stressful end to the league, and one of the worst Mewtwo fights that I've had yet. As a reward for clearing the game and defeating Mewtwo, I evolve Ekans into Arbok. But now I think we're all ready for some optimization. Let's put luck away and figure out how Ekans can do this consistently. After all, it really needs a solution for the champion. Like, Fissure cannot be the correct play. If Fissure is ever the correct play, oh no, I, I don't want to do that run. The first question is what level does Ekans need to move first against the Alakazam? The answer is level 73. The second question is how much Mega Drain would help against the Sand Slash? It turns out that it's doing almost half damage at this level. With a crit, it enables Ekans to get to the Alakazam consistently. Now, three levels higher, Earthquake should one-hit it consistently. And it does. Unfortunately, without a critical hit, Ekans faints over and over to Sand Slash because it's just taking too much damage. 
I'll need more levels to make this consistent. I tried it each level, 74, no, 75, no, 76, no, 77, no, and then at level 78, I too hit the sand slash, and it happened over and over and over. I counted nine victories in a row, and an additional two victories that I got because of critical hits. And uh, yeah, then this happened. Turns out level 78 doesn't always let Ekans win, but 79 does. However, the win-loss ratio at 78 is really good enough. With these 8 additional levels, Alakazam is an easy one-hit, and from there the rest of the fight is much easier. Requiring Ekans to be a higher level for the champion means that it'll also arrive at Lance at a higher level. He did cause some resets, so the extra levels here are nice. I also think that I can improve the results here by just changing up my moveset a little bit. If I keep Dig until here, I can replace it with Rest, allowing Ekans to keep Mega Drain. Dig is very useless against Lance's team because he has so many flying type Pokemon. Rockslide can take care of Gyarados and the first Dragonair in two hits each. Unfortunately, I can get paralyzed here, making things slightly inconsistent, but that's also the case if I have Dig or Earthquake. It doesn't change anything. After that, I can steal Ice Beam and knock out his remaining Pokemon. Ice Beam for Dragonair, Rockslide for Aerodactyl, and Ice Beam for the Dragonite. The extra moveset flexibility by just saving the Earthquake TM just a little bit longer is really nice, and that's basically the strategy here. Because of the level I need for the champion, this also is going to impact the level that I need for Giovanni, and largely this is going to be the level that I'm shooting for throughout the entire playthrough. With a goal finish of level 79, that means that I should arrive at Giovanni around level 66 or 67. The first of which was the level that I beat him at last time, but I had used all my rare candies at that point. So I'm going to need 10 additional levels of grinding to smooth the champion out. Turns out at level 66 Giovanni isn't consistent because Rhydon can live through Mega Drain. At level 68, Ekans can actually survive one of its earthquakes and then take it out on a second turn. So probably what I want to do is level up to level 64 or 65, and then use 2-3 to three rare candies just to stabilize this fight. After that, I can train in Victory Road, there's better experience yields there, and then use all my rare candies before Lorelei to make the League a fast sweep to the champion. The consequence that this has on the rest of the playthrough is that all the gyms between Surge and Giovanni are going to be quite easy. I can just do all my training first, and then go into all of them overleveled. However, there is a bad side to this because I feel like I'm going to have to face nearly every optional trainer just to get this many levels. It's, uh, it's going to be quite slow. The last trainer that I really should test is Brock. I basically need to test him with every Pokemon except water types that have water moves or grass types that have grass moves. Ekans squeezed by him in its first playthrough with a surprising victory at level 13. However, I'm doubtful that this can repeat. I leveled to level 13 so that Ekans would outspeed Onix and trap it with Rap, so let the tests begin. Let's see if I can do it at this level over and over. I trap Geodude and wrap away, it faints, Ekans only took one turn of tackle damage, and then Onyx goes down and Ekans wins with green health. So yeah, this is a pretty dominant performance against the rock solid Pokemon trainer. My snake is obviously much stronger than his. However, the next fight didn't go the same way. Onyx traps me in a bind and Ekans faints. The reason it trapped me here was because Ekans ran out of wrap PP but I can actually prevent my PP from being drained in this way by having Ekans do 2 damage to Geodude every turn instead of 1. Also, I'm going to be able to do this without training, because on its moveset, Ekans already has Leer. So how many is it going to need to make Geodude take 2 damage each turn? 1 Leer doesn't change the damage range, even a critical hit still is doing 1 damage. However, 2 Leers does the trick, and this way I'm able to get to Onix with around 14 uses of Wrap remaining. That's usually enough to knock it out if I don't get awful luck and miss. There are a few things that can mess this fight up though. They're all outside of my control at this level. The first is that Ekans can miss. Ah, it's just really annoying. Moves that don't have full accuracy. Ah. This is especially bad against Geodude because in yellow it only has tackle, so it's just going to hit Ekans and do damage. Second, Ekans can crit Geodude after setting up the two Leers, and in this case, as I mentioned before, it's going to do less damage. Finally, Ekans can miss or get a low number of hits with Wrap on each use. I fought him 10 times to see how this strategy would play out, and Ekans ended up winning 8 and only lost twice. Honestly, I'm surprised. Great job, Ekans. I didn't think it would be this consistent at level 13, but it looks like that's all I need. That concludes my testing, and now I'm going to do a second playthrough attempting to put everything into practice. How much time will this save? Let's find out. I name my Ekans A, short for Ashlyn, and then I fight the rival. He scared me here because Eevee outspeeds on turn 1. We must be speed tied because I go first next and trap with Wrap. 
but my next one misses and Eevee's tackle does so much damage. Oh no, I really do need to be facing Jolteon. I can't have a repeat of my seal playthrough again. My next rap score is a critical hit, and in generation 1 that means every other hit does the same boosted damage, but this doesn't quite finish Eevee off. I try rap again, Ekans moves first, and that's that. I faced the optional rival at level 9 last time, and this didn't let Ekans outspeed the Spearow. At level 10 I just outsped the Spearow, 20 speed versus 19 speed, but today at level 10 I have one less speed. The reason that this probably happened is that last time I trained in this patch of grass, just south of where this battle happens, and there's a lot of level 2 Pokemon here, so you end up knocking out more Pokemon. This time I wanted to be faster, so I trained south of Viridian City on Route 1, but because of this I end up gaining less stat experience, resulting in less speed. Uh, so that's annoying, but either way I still win. Ekans levels up to level 13 on the mandatory bug catcher at the end of the forest, and now we can see that my speed stat is the desired value, 24, and that's enough to outspeed Onyx. My tests suggest that I should have an 80% chance to defeat Brock. Let's do it. I use Leer two turns in a row on Geodude to soften it up so that my snake can preserve its PP for Brock's snake. Unfortunately, I get a miss with Rap, and Geodude hits me for a third time, which is the first bit of bad luck for the fight. Geodude faints and I have 14 uses of Rap left for Onyx. Okay, that's going according to plan at least. You might wonder how many leers it would take to do 2 damage to Onyx. I did test this, it, uh, it would take 5 leers. Trying this exposes Ekans to way too much risk. Screech, bind, tackle. I fought him trying it this way, but it just like doesn't work. I lost all of my attempts. Doing 1 damage a hit is slow, but it's steady, and that's the pace that Ekans needs to defeat Brock. One of the goals for this playthrough now is to level up more than I did last time. To do so, I'm going to fight most of the optional trainers along the way that normally I skip. Backtracking later is just going to take more time than just battling them now. I even go into Misty's gym first and face the trainers here before I face the rival on Nugget Bridge. And, uh, and then this happens. Rap misses, sand through sand attacks, and things become extremely frustrating. I miss just a few too many times here. Eevee's tackles are hitting hard because my defense was lowered, and Ekans goes down. Alright, so I'm doing this fight one level higher than last time, and it wasn't a problem before. This shouldn't be a problem now. Right? Right? Well, Rap just loves to miss. Especially on Sandshrew. Okay, so Scratch, that's not too bad. Okay, of course it misses against Sandshrew, and it gets a Sand Attack. That makes Ekans miss just enough times for the Rattata to knock it out. Okay, two resets of the optional rival. I, I did not expect this. Okay, what if I just use Bite instead of Wrap against Sandshrew? If I can just knock it out quickly... Ah, uh, okay, so that's a three hit range. Well, at least I didn't get hit with Sand Attack this time. But Ekans has low defense, and Rattata does a lot of damage, taking me into red before Eevee comes out. I don't think that I'm going to be able to take it out fast enough now. And despite me, it even gets a Sand Attack just before it knocks me out. So yeah, remember a minute ago when I mentioned that I fought the trainers in Misty's gym before this fight? Yeah, if I can't win here, I have to grind on wild Pokemon. There are no other trainers available to me at this point. Plus, I pretty much defeated everyone up to this point in the game. I really don't want to have to do that, so like, please, Ekans, just do it. Spearow got a growl first turn, so things aren't looking good again. I'll go for a wrap against Sandshrew and just hope that I can trap it. Please don't miss. And this time, Sandshrew goes down without attacking. Rattata hits with a massive crit, taking Ekans to just under half health. Well, that's frustrating, but at least I'm moving on to his ace. Bite does a quarter, Growl lowers Ekans' attack, Bite does less, Tail Whip lowers Ekans' defense. Okay, so it looks like I'm going to need two more hits. And then Eevee just doesn't use tackle, so that's it. Ekans finally did it, but this was not the easy fight that I expected. After fighting some extra trainers on Nugget Bridge, Ekans is two levels higher than before, and I was hoping that this would let me one-hit the Staryu. Unfortunately, it still survives, but Misty uses an X defense, so I get the free KO anyways. It's time for Starmie, and I have a different strategy this time. I can use Glare first turn, causing paralysis and cutting its speed. With Ekans moving first, I can use Wrap to trap it and slowly whittle it down. I get two critical hits along the way, which speed things up, and Misty's ace falls without ever dealing any damage. In Surge's gym, I do something that I haven't done in a long time. I actually fight the trainers. Ekans has Dig, and I need all the experience that I can get in this playthrough. After all, once I defeat him, these trainers won't be accessible anymore. With them out of the way, I face Surge, and Dig one-shots his Raichu with ease. 
in Rock Tunnel, I get some awful luck against the first Pokemaniac. I miss rap on Slowpoke, its confusion confuses Ekans, and then everything falls apart. I should have tried Dig like I suggested before when I got it to around half health or maybe a little bit less. That's what I end up doing in the next fight, and it works really well. Now it's mid game time. After defeating the rival in Pokemon Tower, I settle in for a long training session. I'm going to defeat most of the trainers in each area that I enter. First is Cycling Road. After that's Erica's Gym. I face her next, get paralyzed at Gloom, but it has no moves that can do anything to Ekans effectively, so yeah, victory is a foregone conclusion. Sylph is next. After defeating all these easy trainers, I even face the harder ones with the Hypnos. Ekans is a high enough level now that it can manage them. Before fighting the rival, I make a trip to the department store and feed Ekans some final vitamins. I want it to be as prepared as it can be for the tough trainers that are next. The first of them, of course, is the Sylph rival. Ekans Dig does half to Sand Slash, it crits with Slash for a third, I choose Mega Drain to heal, Sand Slash hangs on, uses Sand Attack, we both miss, I miss again, Sand Slash crits, and then Ekans knocks it out. Okay, so that's not a good way to start the fight. I miss Dig on Ninetales, giving it a chance to use Quick Attack once before it faints to my second Dig. Cloyster isn't a Pokemon that I'm actually worried about, it's actually going to heal Ekans because I can use Mega Drain on it before Kadabra comes out. Well, uh, that is if I can actually connect with my Mega Drains. <sighs> Finally, my fourth one does, and Kadabra comes out next. But at this level, Ekans is faster, so lower accuracy is the only threat now. But Dig still hits, and Kadabra goes down. Jolteon's Pin Missile hits twice, and then Dig knocks it out. That was a rough fight, but thankfully I was still successful. Koga's next. I'm level 56, ensuring that I can one-hit all of the Venonats. Venomoth comes out, Rock Slide takes it into red, it uses Psychic. I pray that it's not a critical hit. It isn't, Ekans survives, and knocks the Moth out. I train in Blaine's gym, I also train in Sabrina's gym, I take an excursion to the power plant for an additional rare candy, I think that I need it this time. At level 59, I should be able to defeat Blaine. I one hit the Ninetales, one hit the Rapidash, I don't one hit the Arcanine, it uses Fire Blast, gets a crit, and Ekans faints. Ah, <sighs> okay, so that was unlucky. I try again, and Ekans is the lucky one this time, scoring a crit against the Arcanine. All of this training has resulted in Ekans' speed being only 129. Sabrina's Alakazam has 133 speed. <laughs> it's very frustrating. At least I can move first against her first two Pokemon and avoid their accuracy lowering tactics. Alakazam comes out, it uses Recover first turn, Ekans digs, Psychic misses while I'm underground, and Dig takes the Psychic Fox to red. Please don't use Psychic again. Alakazam hears me, it uses Reflect, and gets knocked out as a result. So yeah, her AI is really bad. Ugh. I finish up my training on Route 15, and then I use 5 of my 10 rare candies, bringing Ekans up to level 70 for Giovanni. Dig one-shots Doug Trio, Body Slam can't paralyze Persian because it's a normal type, but it's going to be a 2 hit anyways, so I don't think that the extra turn of Dig is a good choice, especially when it can set up double team. Dig KOs Nidoqueen, Nidoking is the same, and then I use Mega Drain on Rhydon. It doesn't quite do enough. The Rhino hits Ekans with a super effective Earthquake, but my tiny poisonous snake survives. That's why level 70 was the plan. I finish off the rival, and then Ekans heads to the league. I got a clean sweep up until Lance last time, and I was 5 levels lower. However, there is a point of inconsistency here, and that's Lorelei's Slowbro, because it knows Psychic and Amnesia. After it's set up, this thing is terrifying for a poison type. So that's one loss. It gets me again. In the third fight, I do manage to take it out, finish Jinx with ease, Lapras survives, uses Body Slam, and then it falls. From there, I obviously sweep the next two trainers who are just awful, and then I arrive at Lance. In my first playthrough, I lost against him twice. I think that Ekans is prepared this time though because I have my signature move, Rest. Rock Slide takes Gyarados into red, Hydro Pump hits Ekans, and it gets a critical hit, but Ekans survives and Rock Slide KOs. Rest lets me heal, I mimic Ice Beam, Rock Slide knocks Aerodactyl out, and Ice Beam manages the Dragonite. So. I've arrived back at the champion, but this time Ekans is level 80. I intentionally held off teaching Earthquake this long so that I could replace Mimic with it for this fight. If I taught it earlier, then I wouldn't have had the 4 moves that I needed for Lance. Ground type attacks are pretty useless against him after all. In many of my playthroughs, you ask why do I not replace Dig earlier on with Earthquake, and a lot of times it's because I'm saving Earthquake just for this moveset flexibility in the league. So if you see me holding on to Dig for too long, it's probably because of this reason. 
Now, will all my planning pay off? Let's find out against the champion. Sand Slash is first, Mega Drain does half, Earthquake does over half to Ekans, and I finish his first team member off, healing to just over half in the process. Alakazam is next, but at this level, Ekans outspeeds, uses Earthquake, and it gets the KO. Executor time. Because of its good AI, it thinks that Hypnosis is super effective, so it's going to use this on the first turn. The champion also has AI modification 1, so if my Pokemon has a status condition, then it's going to stop using Hypnosis. That's why it doesn't just spam it. This fight is going pretty slow because I have to use Rock Slide here. Executor puts Ekans to sleep, so this is annoying. I get lucky because Ekans wakes up quickly and crits for the knockout. Cloister's next, and it isn't an issue because this time I have Mega Drain. And after that, Earthquake takes out Ninetales and the Jolteon. Ekans clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 41 minutes, and 23 seconds. It's at level 81 with 7 resets, and a game time of 6 hours and 27 minutes. When I put these two playthroughs results side by side, I really can't believe how close they are. I've lowered my real time and resets, but game time and level have both increased. This obviously makes sense. I think the reason that I didn't see a more dramatic reduction in real time like I normally do is because I actually lucked through the first playthrough at an incredibly fast time. I should have been at the champion for much longer. For that reason, I think that the second playthrough is a realistic reflection of Ekans' abilities. However, I wasn't very satisfied with my play against Lorelei, and I planned to finish at level 79, not 81, so I did do two levels of extra training. I could save some time here. So I reloaded my save just before I fought Sabrina, and went back in to try and shave off some playtime. Let's watch Ekans stomp all the way through these trainers. While we do, I'm going to explain a realization that I had about my experience management during the league. In playthrough 2, I saved 6 rare candies until the last possible minute, using them right before Lance. Because Ekans is leveling up with experience at lower levels, I figured that this would allow me to squeeze in one or two more levels. And uh, yeah it did. However, if I use 5 rare candies right before Lorelei, then Ekans is at a higher level for her. Because I have Rock Slide and Mega Drain, I'm already set up for success against her. Why would I mimic Amnesia and just spend extra time fighting Slowbro when it can set up with Psychic and Amnesia itself? Instead, I can just knock it out right away with Mega Drain. Turn 2, it's always going to use Amnesia because of her AI, so I survive the first turn and heal with Mega Drain. This brings it into red health, and that means that Lorelei has the chance to use a Super Potion. It's actually a 50% chance. She does, twice, giving Ekans the knockout. And then Rock Slide takes care of the Jinx, and also since it's a higher level, it can now survive Blizzard without a problem. No resets this time. The strategy is the same for the rest of the league. I win in all the fights and make it to the champion. This time I'm level 79, so right according to the plan. Remember, I need this level to two hit the Sand Slash with Mega Drain, so I can't come into this fight at any lower level. Now the fight's consistent and Ekans takes the victory, clocking in slightly faster than before. 1 hour, 38 minutes and 14 seconds of real time at level 79 with 5 resets. That's a game time of 6 hours and 19 minutes. So, how does Ekans stack up against other Pokemon that I've used in yellow? Its real time is slower than Diglett and Onix, unfortunately it is the inferior snake. It's very close to Cubone, and it's faster than Coughing. Since I only did one playthrough with Zubat, there's not a direct comparison here, but if we look at their first playthroughs, Ekans had only one less reset, making it one of the worst performing Pokemon so far. However, on my second attempt I only had 7 resets and then 5 with my final Lorelei strategy. When comparing resets, that final result places it by a Pokemon like Clefairy or Diglett for this metric. Its game time is slower than Onix and faster than Cubone and Diglett. It's quite obviously the superior team rocket Pokemon over coughing. Move pool diversity guarantees that. So out of everything, its performance is the closest with Cubone. Playthrough 2 was slightly slower, my fixed ending was slightly faster, they got similar game times, but Cubone did have more resets and finished at a higher level. It looks like Ekans just barely edges out the cute bone wielding Pokemon for the top of the E tier. But before we place it there, let's settle this with a tie breaking match against Oak. Cubone lost once against him, let's see how Ekans can do. It's over leveled because it needed to be for the champion, I fought Oak's team with Blastoise, and as you can see, Ekans is managing it really well. I thought this would be the most difficult team, but maybe it isn't. What about if Oak has Charizard? Uh, nope. Ekans completely smashes this team too. Venusaur? Funnily enough, this fight's actually the closest. However, the ease with which Ekans managed all of these fights convinces me that it deserves its spot ahead of Cubone. The ground type had to rely on Mimic Hypnosis strategies for the Oak fight, but Ekans just won straight up. 
So, well done, Sassy Snake. Like, subscribe, ring the Trimeco, and comment because I gotta read them all. Also, thanks so much to all my patrons. Now, if you've made it this far, you're incredible. It's bloopers time. Ekans has 35 HP, 60 attack, 44 defense, 40 speed, and 55... Oh, 40 speed, that's 40 special. Ekans has 35 HP, 60 attack, 44 defense, 40 special. I wrote speed in the script, I gotta change that. I'm just gonna keep saying speed. Special. The first stage Pokemon that are weaker in terms of base stat total are Nidoran Male, Spearow, Jig Diglett, oh, Jiglet. All I need to ensure is that Enix, 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 it's Ekans and Onix put together. No. <laughs> the first major will hurt, the first major will, uh, I think the advantage against the Caterpie line with voice, with Voison Sting. What am I saying? Not that. The advantage that Ekans, I just hit the desk. Uh, my snake, my snake, my snake is having PP problems. No. <laughs> my attack stat in combination with my speed tat, Speed tat. Ah, first blooper of the day. Yes, this this recording has taken me two days to do. <laughs> if you're like in the bloopers, like what is he talking about? Like he's done a bunch of bloopers already. No, no, no. Today was going really well. Luckily, her Alakazam also isn't very great, so I do manage to finish it off and earn myself the march march badge. Oh, come on. Next is Persian. It goes for double team, causing me to miss. It sets up again. My body, my body slam. It chooses Screech, so once again, once again, ha, huh. Sean Connery is back. Hitmonchan takes who, who hits from Earthquake. Things can be a lot worse though, because Sandslash can crit and knocks Ekans out. Uh, ah, that's how this fight felt, like exactly like that sound, just that sound. I might need to black out and love, black out. Yeah, that black out. That's the term. Was, why does my brain say black in? It's definitely not black in. No, it's not. <laughs> However, the Needle Queen is still able to survive Earthquake and flattens on Onyx. Not Onyx, this is a different snake. It's a it's a bad snake too. Both Onyx and Ekans are bad snakes. The only snake that has a hope of being even a little bit good is Arbok. Yeah. Dragonair, I guess Dragonair. Dragonair is kind of a cool snake. It's she's pretty. I like her. <laughs>